Welcome to the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast, M3. the number one resource for automotive sales professionals, managers, and owners M3. to learn how to make money, accumulate wealth, and to all out ball out in the auto industry. And now your hosts, Sean V. Bradley and L.A. Williams. One, two, three, four, five. M3. Hey everybody, this is Sean B. Bradley, president of Dealer Synergy, man, and oh my god, who do we got here? We got Franca V. Down Bambikitis in the building. Say what's up, Franca. Hey, everyone. All right, so first and foremost, let's get this out because you've been in the industry for like nine and a half years uh, supporting thousands of dealerships, and I want to get this right. What is the correct pronunciation of your name? You have it right. It's Franca. Some people like to say Franca, but I grew up everyone saying Franca, so Franca's perfectly fine. Okay, but but here's the controversy though. What is your what did your parents name you? Didn't they name you Franca though? Yes, but Franca is fine and I love it. So it's very unique. I, I've never in my life met a Franca or Franca. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So say tomatoes and tomato. But um I am really proud that I have the opportunity to interview you because we've interviewed dealer principals, general managers, GSMs, sales managers, et cetera. And you are a high level sales manager, but you don't work in the dealership. You are obviously at Dealer Synergy. What's your official title at Dealer Synergy? Performance coach manager. Okay. And so can you give a little bit of explanation of what that actually means? So I'm overseeing our performance coaches but I'm also overseeing all of our clients. So managing all of our different accounts. Um, They like to call me air traffic controller, right? So I love that fun nickname, but I like to say I'm controlling the airspace of dealer synergy. So whether that's my, you know, executive management team, whether it's my performance coach team, our clients, all the different services that we, we provide, I am, you know, managing the airspace of dealer synergy. So let's let's go through this. You've been working with us for nine and a half years. You started out like Drake from the bottom, right? Like you started yes. off as as a CS rep, like a support mm-hmm. agent, and climbed the ranks, okay, to supervisor, to director, to now heading up the CS department. So under your control, you are managing the trainers, the CRM performance managers, the consultants the mystery shoppers, the call monitors, the HR, um, you're managing me, the executives. Mm -hmm. And so when we say air traffic control, if if I'm, I don't want to speak for you, but Mm -hmm. you are like managing the chessboard, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're, you know, you are the one that is the the face of dealer synergy to the dealers, Mm -hmm. you know, where me and Tiana and, and LA are running around the country doing what we do there. You're at home base almost always and making sure that the trainers, the analysts, the CRM people, the HR people are all building those pieces together. Is that correct? Absolutely. All right. So is it an easy job? No, but that's what I like about it is that it's not easy and that is challenging. It's rewarding. What is, okay, all bullshit aside, what's so rewarding about it? Like, I mean, because people say it's rewarding. Because if you, you know, the, being, you know, faced with a challenge and sometimes they're like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do, how I'm going to overcome this. A lot of what we do is problem solving. And so when we do solve those problems, it is super rewarding. And knowing that, you know, we're able to, you know, whether it's getting Sean from point A to point B or doing things for our clients, whatever the case may be, once we finally get it done and we're successful at it, it is super rewarding. Well, I got to tell you, um, I get a tremendous amount of feedback and compliments about you, Sin Hanley, you and your team. And I try to explain to them, I was like, look, I might be the mouth mm-hmm. and the, the, like one of the faces of dealer synergy, but you truly are one of the main secret reasons why we've been in business for, you know, at least the last nine and a half years that you've been here, Mm -hmm. because your whole job is making sure that our team obviously fulfills our contractual obligations. But more importantly than that, there's two things that I want you to talk about is your main protocol is either to help dealerships solve their problems Mm -hmm. Or help them achieve goals. Let's let's talk about the problems. From my understanding, you solve some type, uh, like a lot of times, problems that are not even contracted for. Correct? 
Yes. Okay. Explain, explain like the day-to-day operations of a dealership, all the shit that could happen. And like, you know, we're, we're in the CSI crime scene. So, I mean, we meet with our clients every single day and, you know, we go into these meetings with agendas and things that we want to talk about. Um, But in those meetings, you know, we're always asking them, you know, you know, what's going on? What can we help you with? And, you know, that's our job. We want to find out what's going on. We don't want to just talk about what they're, what they're not doing, what they should be doing, what they're doing great. We really want to truly understand their dealership, their department, what's going on, the things that truly matter to them. Um, And sometimes when we open that up, we find out things that maybe we weren't asking initially, but by doing so, we are finding the things that they really are being challenged by. And then as a team, we work together and see what we can do to help. And so we really do have to sometimes think outside of the box, but that one thing can truly make a difference for their team and their results and so on. So it really is, you know, again, we go in with an agenda, but they give us other things and we welcome the challenge because we know if we can help them and it truly helps them, you know, it's all worth it. I love that. And I want to share a couple of examples of this, but I, I don't even know all of them because you're the one who handles all this stuff and I don't get involved unless this is a problem I need to get involved in. But one of the things I, I find that it's really blows me away is that dealers hire us to, to, to either do recruiting, staffing, mm-hmm. they hire us to do training, onboarding for either green peas or advanced people. We're, we're there to do internet BDC showroom, uh, CRM, et cetera. There's a myriad of different things, but it's very rare or never happens that people hire us because we have Spanish speaking employees, right? Mm-hmm. You know where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. <laughs> but there's been numerous times that we've had clients that, that, that didn't have a Spanish speaking employee. And so they know that we have people that Spanish is their first language at dealer synergy. And they literally are calling us and having us do TOs from out of state in real time. Can you talk about a couple of these examples? It's just crazy. Yeah. So they may have somebody that they, you know, somebody calls in, they don't uh, speak English and they need somebody and nobody in the dealership can speak Spanish and they don't know what to do. So they call dealer synergy and we have our secret weapon on the team and she goes right into the CRM. She calls them, sets appointments all of that. And it's just amazing. And so, you know, she even helps with the follow-up and making sure. And so it's just things that you don't think that you could use us for, you know, we're here or even just the live TO in general, you know, LA LA Williams, you know, we always say, if you need a live TO call LA and we will get LA on the phone. He does a live TO sets the appointment next thing, you know, they're in later in the day. And sometimes people don't believe us. And we just say, just call us and try. How do you know until you try? And when they do, they're blown away that if we say we're going to do something, we actually will. And I got to just tell you what I found out because they didn't, they didn't ask my permission. They just did it is I, I don't, we don't need to mention the dealer, but from my understanding, one of our clients had a voice over IP phone system and they were utilizing mm-hmm. LA so much. They had an extension at the dealership out of state whenever they needed a live TO. And it was set up with what's called a call whisper because LA's blind. So it would ring LA's cell phone and it would say, TO from ABC Motors. So LA would turn on and answer LA Williams of ABC Motors. And then he just went right into the live TO. I mean, think about what I just said, an, out, an, an outside company, a training consulting company that set up a voice over IP to one of our executives to do real-time TOs. Like that shit's not part of contract. That is us really just kind of going above and beyond helping out. What are some of the other things that you do, Franca, that um, that are just help dealers that they're surprised at? You know, I think sometimes people just think that we're helping with the different services that we provide. But then if they bring other challenges, you know, they don't always realize the network that we have or the people that we know. And so when they tell us they're having a specific challenge and we're like, wait, we have a person for you. And it's not that because it benefits us in any way, it's for them. And then, you know, we connect them with this individual and then, you know, they start their relationship. And again, they're just so surprised that maybe it wasn't something directly that we did, but we just made a connection from somebody within our network or our group. And so we help them in that way too. I'll tell you one, yesterday, literally we had a dealership from Kentucky um, that we're working with and we're setting up the full-blown BDC. So we're doing CRM work, we're doing video work. And so they didn't have a video email, video text messaging resource that 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 that's needed in my opinion for this to work flawlessly within the CRM. So we contacted BombBomb, had them, you know, work with BombBomb and get set up with BombBomb. 
Then, you know, they were going through a website solution with a way subpar website provider. So we don't sell websites. We don't make money on websites. However, my colleagues for the last 20 plus years are CEOs, CFOs, chief operating officers, presidents of these national companies. So I just jump on a cell phone. I'm like, you know, and I call one of my people that own a, a web development company that's got, I don't know. 3,000 rooftops. I'm like, listen, I've got a small dealership in the South that needs a little help and they're getting blasted from their, their OEM, you know, authorized, you know, uh, website provider. Can you help out? Boom. With in minutes, they're coming in and they're rolling it out. So I didn't think of that. That's mm-hmm. definitely something that we help with is our network. You heard of American Express. It's like, you know, membership has privileges. Like we like to joke mm-hmm. around that membership with the dealer, with dealer synergy has privileges. Our external ner- network is imperative, you know, to, overall success Mm because i'm very good at what i do we're very good at what we do but there's things that are outside of our scope at dealer synergy that a dealership needs okay whether it's dms it's crm it's inventory management it's pricing it's this whatever it may be Mm -hmm. and so if we don't do it internally we have that network on speed dial that we could go to i love that Mm -hmm. what other some examples do you think that we do that's that people are not really aware of in supporting a dealer I feel like we do so many things. I say uh, HR, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, our HR, uh, just the way our, our, you know, HR is a need. Everyone needs people, right? And so they come to us to help them with HR, um, but just our system and helping them. So we're in the back, you know, doing all of the recruiting, all of the interviewing, setting this up. You know, we actually set up the interviews for them when they arrive. We're doing all the confirmations, things like that. So everybody has- Pay pay plans, job descriptions, Mm -hmm. agendas, employee value package proposition. We're doing another dealer on the West Coast right now. They have us- you know, that they're, they're short staff and they're, they're coming up short. So we are doing like really cool unconventional things, mm-hmm. everything from, you know, uh, contacting universities, vocational schools, high schools, not only for intern programs, but for job fairs and for proactive recruitment, not just throwing bait into mm-hmm. indeed.com or glass door. Mm-hmm. All right. Can you give us like a, like a, like a, like, let's just say a dealership was on a program like ABC Motors. So we got a dealership on our program that just went on for full-blown monthly support. Um, how, what is your process? How do you get them onboarded? So, you know, we do all of our initial kickoff meetings. We want them to meet our team and really just set proper expectations of what's to come. There's so many things that come along with our monthly support program, and there's so many different moving pieces. So one of the very first things is, you know, we want to introduce them to our team, get to know their team, and really just set proper expectations. You know, we wish that we could just switch a a light uh, switch on and everything would be turned on and we're good to go. But it takes time. And so we really just want to set the proper expectations of what's to come next, what that timeline is going to look like um, so we can get the ball rolling. So, so the first part is once uh, our sales department or business development department secures a, 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 a client partner relationship, right? So we sold dealer synergy product or services. Mm-hmm. It goes to Franca and her team. First thing they're going to do is set up a kickoff meeting, mm-hmm. and then we're going to go. Th- they're going to go through and set expectations. Here is what we contracted for. Here is what our products and services are. Here's the timeline of when we're doing this, when we're doing that. Here's what we need to do at Dealer Synergy. Here's what you need to do at the client level. So we're all on the same page. Then we have what's called a client intake form. So we obviously have to get all the details, login, passwords, users, contact information, et cetera. And we got to format our system. We actually, just like you uh, dealers, we have a CRM called Zoho. Um, So we don't use VIN or those, those are dealership CRMs. We have a business to business CRM called Zoho, like Salesforce. And we create the account in there. We create the contacts in there. And then we just start piecing it together. So um, one of the things is recruiting and staffing. Mm-hmm. So can you kind of share like, like what are the, from your honest opinion, would you say that HR is one of the biggest challenges in dealerships? It can be right. Because, you know, There's, we need people and then, you know, we may staff them and then they lose people. So it's just always this, you know, constant cycle that we're going through. 
Uh, so it can be challenging. And, but that's why we feel that need because we know that people need people, right? Um, and sometimes in dealerships, everyone's so busy and different things are going on. So we just, you know, we'll take that off your plate. We'll get everything set up for you, lined up for you. And you just need to do the final interview and decide whether or not you're going to hire them. Yeah. So our process is we do everything from the job creations, the, the put the job syndication out there from Glassdoor, Indeed, ZipRecruiter. We're creating videos for social media, for TV commercials, for cable on like video promotions for job recruitment. So they're like web commercials. We're creating graphics for social media for paid and organic. We're also creating an email blast that they could deploy through their CRM or DMS or from their permi- permission-based emails, uh, you know, campaign. We're also doing social media like Facebook, you know, recruitment, uh, Instagram recruitment, TikTok recruitment, and especially LinkedIn recruitment. We're also working on their Glassdoor and Indeed page. Pages, um, if they they subscribe to that service where we help them format their Glassdoor review page, their Indeed.com review page. And again, I mentioned before, we do everything from the job descriptions, expectations, the schedule, the pay plan, and you know, even you know, help them with the onboarding strategy. And what is it like when dealers are, are losing money or frustrated because they lost somebody, somebody quit, somebody got fired. And they're, and then all of a sudden we come in and save the day and we, we find them two or three people, you know what I mean? That they, they desperately needed. What's that like? It's uh, well, there's two parts of it, right? Because we filled a need, but then we get to train them and then we get to work with these people. And then we also get to share in their success and watch them grow. So there's two parts of it, you know, and for the people that we're staffing or are hiring these candidates, we let them know too that you're not just going to get put in the position and that's it. You're we're actually there working with you, training with you, um, and it helps them feel comfortable too that they also have us. So there's many different aspects to it. One, we're helping the dealer, and then two, once they are you know uh, hired and and they're working, we get to train them, watch them grow, um, and so it's very rewarding in, in multiple ways. One of the things that one of our biggest products that we have is the Bradley on Demand. We have a video on demand training, tracking, testing, certification program. And I've seen a lot of people in other programs. And one of the biggest differences is that our account reps, they don't just do login and passwords. I mean, can you talk about like how proud you are of of Naima, Mm -hmm. Michael and their team and what they do? So their goal is to get you to train, right? And not just train on anything. You know, we want to create very clear training paths based on the wants and needs and making sure we have different levels of training. Um, So it really is our goal once we get them into the system to make sure that they're training, but training in the right areas. Um, And not just that they're, they're in the system, right? And watching videos. We don't never want to say that they're just watching videos. So we pay very close attention to their passive percentages, things of that nature. But, you know, we have our own internal logs of the percentages of people training. And each month we're increasing, increasing, increasing. But that's because on a daily basis, we're just calling people, talking about their team, what their challenges are, creating custom assignments. So we let them know it's important to us. And we really try to find out what those challenges are. So, Franca, one of the things that you just said is is really critical, folks. The biggest problem with online training is that most people don't hold it accountable. And these companies that provide it, I'm not saying that they don't care, but they don't have, I think, adequate support and accountability. Let me explain. Just because, like I was just saying, somebody has a login, a password, and they press play doesn't mean they're actually learning. Here's what happens. Scenario one that we find, right? Mm-hmm. And I think you're the one that, that, that pointed this out to me, you and, and Michael, were that, okay, so people log into it. But think about this. If they're being yelled at, go, go train, go, go, go log in to Bradley and a man, go train, go train. Okay, go, okay, boss. I go train. But if somebody keeps interrupting him, hey, hey, Franca, mm-hmm. hey, Franca, hey, don't, don't hit me. You know what I mean? Because I'm poking today, <laughs> but hey, Franca, hey, Franca, hey, how can I learn and absorb the training if I, if I got somebody, <laughs> they just keep bothering me, you know what I mean? And interrupting me. Or if I don't have freaking headsets, if it's too noisy, I can't really concentrate, right? So that's, that's being positive. That's assuming that the person actually gives a shit and wants to learn the training, but they're not in the right environment. They're not in, in, a, in a secluded area or they're, they're, they're they're being distracted. They're being interrupted. Hey, there's an up, there's this, and, that. and I'm not saying it's, it's, it might be irrelevant banter or irrelevant interruptions. And an interruption is an interruption, regardless if it was valuable or not, it's still interruption. Now on a realistic side, there's some people that just don't give a shit. 
And if the teacher's not watching, they might not, you know, really be paying attention. So what they do is they'll press play and watch and then guess the answers. How do we know that? Because if we're looking at all the data and if, if it shows that Franca watched 12 modules of Bradley Demand, but she only passed five, these are not rocket science things, man. This is car sales. It's not quantum physics. So that basically means either A, they're not paying attention or they're not in an environment or they're being distracted or B, they're trying to game the system. So by us just being cognizant and aware of that, it really does help. Just like the, the, the you know, if you've got police on the street, it will deter some people from criminal activity, you know, metaphorically speaking, because there's police that are out there, especially if they're carrying machine guns and bulletproof vests. It's like, maybe I don't want to fuck with those people. You know what I mean? So if the dealership knows that somebody's actually paying attention and not just service paying attention, mm -hmm. there's more utilization. But one thing that I, I like that you guys did in the CS department was you guys reach out to the management in the beginning, middle, and at the end of the month to find out, okay, what are your overall problems or challenges? What are your goals? And then you guys go in and create work assignments. Can you talk about what these work assignments are? Yeah. So, I mean, if you were to see inside our Bradley on Demand platform, there's so much content available. So it's easy to get lost. Um, but if we can identify exactly what you want your team to focus on based on what they're struggling on, their challenges, whatever the case may be, we can create these custom assignments and then we can track them too. So you can set deadlines, watch their progress throughout it, but it really helps making sure that they're focusing on the things they need to focus on this month. Again, we don't want them just to be in there just to train. We want them to have an agenda of plans so that they see results. 100%. And then um, what I also like that your people are doing is that they're customizing content. Almost everybody in Bradley Demand gets a custom skin. And uh, again, it's it's not going to be Bradley Demand for your store. It's going to be ABC University. For example, it might be, um, let's say like Nissan Abui. It's Nissan Abui University. Let's just say it, it, Coons. You know what I mean? It's Coons University. It's not Bradley Demand. And we're we're working with all of our clients to be able to have them add their own content, whether it's HR, it's the employee handbook, it's the onboarding, it's the sexual harassment policy, it's the TCPA guidelines for text messaging, or it's just if they've got somebody in the dealership that's great at service, how to work the service drive, they're they're recording that and putting it on a platform, how to get the best CSI. So that we are literally aggregating content for that dealership from that dealership to put in their own private space. So our virtual training is more like a hybrid where it's our content. I've spent over seven and a half million dollars cash building over 8,400 modules. And then the dealers are adding their own. So it's like a super system, mm -hmm. right? Yep, absolutely. Okay. What would you say is the most, I don't know, surprising thing when it comes to Bradley and Amand? Like with the utilization, like, cause I know that we're tracking our clients successes and I see that they're like, you know, when they're getting certified on like 500 modules or like that, what is the stuff that's exciting for you and your CS team when you see them win or they achieve a milestone? Like what's so it's just seeing them go through the certifications, but not just that, because for a lot of them, we don't just work with them through Bradley on demand. We work with them through phone training and we listen to their phone calls and things like that. So when we actually see them implement the things that they're learning, that's awesome. Um, and it, it's just, when you actually see them applying it. That's when it all kind of connects and you know what makes sense and they're really learning. Now, so let's just switch gears for a second mm -hmm. here. Let's get a, let's get more into Franca. So uh, let's talk about your husband for a second here. So he's disclaimer. Mm -hmm. He's that my co-star in the Vice TV show that that I, that I was a season finale in. So uh, the ball guy in the TV show that's that's her husband. That's Billy V. Mm -hmm. So Billy's got I got twenty three years experience in automotive. He's at least twenty six, going on twenty seven years automotive. Worked at some big stores in North Jersey. He worked all over the country in Florida, California. He was just recently a general manager for several years at an at independent dealership in Pennsylvania. But can you tell everybody what's hubby doing now? So now he works for Westlake Financial. He is an account manager for the PA and New Jersey region. Oh, so your husband is sophisticated. He's a bank representative. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, Billy is like a, an amazing subprime guy. That That's his superpower. He's always been an amazing special finance salesperson, special finance 
manager, special finance director, and now he's working for arguably one of the best banks and one of the best special finance banks in the country, uh, which is Westlake. And he has, uh, you know, two amazing territories, Pennsylvania, which obviously Mm -hmm. includes Philadelphia and the entire state of New Jersey. So between New Jersey and Pennsylvania, there's a ton of stores that are there. So you get this from multiple high level people. Mm -hmm. You say like, I'm your, your work husband sometimes. Right. And and so, (laughs) yeah. So you've got like us and your dealer synergy family, which is all automotive, but then you go home and you've got a former general manager husband. That's now a bank representative. So are you, is it like, are you, do you get suffocated from automotive? I don't, I actually, I, I learned from it. Right. So I learned from being in dealer synergy, But then also, you know, when my husband's out in the field and from the things he shares with me now with, you know, the new company he's working for. So I always take it as an opportunity to learn more about things that I didn't really know about before. So I love being immersed in it. Um, I never saw myself in this field. And now that I am, I can never see myself outside of it. I love it. Man. Okay. So then why is it? And I know this is a loaded question. And by the way, you have no idea what it fucking took to get this girl to do this interview. (laughs) I've been asking for this for years. And so uh, I want to say to you that like you're our secret weapon at dealer synergy. And I'm so proud of Mm -hmm. you for doing this podcast because this is out of your comfort zone. She's like more behind the scenes, you know, tactical person, but uh, I think that the, the the industry needs to know who you are more. Mm-hmm. Like our clients know who you are, but you know, outside of our client base, like they might not know you, so they will now. Why is it? And I know this is a loaded mm-hmm. question. It's not fair. I ask this, but I'm Sean Brown. I'm gonna ask anyway. Why do they love you so much, girl? Like, what is it? Because I, I, they rave about you. They don't be like I take her or leave her like me. I mean, like, ah, Sean's an asshole, or he's great, you know, or whatever. But like everybody loves you. Why? Why do they love you so much? I just always try to to be there for all of our dealers. Um, you know, if I say I'm going to do something, I always want to follow through with it. But I really do truly care about all of our dealers. So when I say, you know, you can call me after hours, you can text me after hours, I'll answer. I actually do. So I always try to make sure that if I say I'm going to do something, I do it and I'm always there for them. Um, you know, I always say if I don't have the answer, I'll get it from the right person. So I just want them to know that they can always utilize me as a resource. Um, and I also just truly love to just get to know them more. You know, I become friends with a lot of them on Facebook and really get to truly, you know, understand the things that they like to do or more about their families. And when I have these conversations with them, they're like, well, how did you know that? Um, and it's like, well, I was on Facebook. I follow you, you know, so I show interest in things and it's not just to show it. It's because I truly do care and I want to be able to connect with them outside of just what we do every single day. And I think when they see that effort, they appreciate it and they can see that I'm genuine about it. Now, I, I would I would say that hands down, like you definitely care. And I want to transition. It was a setup question mm-hmm. for you is I find that for your employees, your team under you, when I think of like Brianna, who's one of the newest rock stars mm-hmm. on our team with five years internet director experience, et cetera. You know, when we have like V and we look at Michael, Naima, Malik, oh my God, mm-hmm. Malik, you know, like you're not the only one. They care as well. But mm-hmm. I think the reason why your employees care as much as, as they do about dealer synergy and especially the clients is because they see their leader, they see their mm-hmm. boss that cares. So can you like, am I wrong on that? Or is it, do you think that that you influence them or? I do. And I think that they see that I care about them every single Mm -hmm. time. One of my team members, you know, anytime they win, I win. And I love seeing their growth. That to me means so much, you know, like you just said with Bree, with Malik, I remember when they first started at the company and to see where they're at now. And then when our clients share really positive feedback about them, I'm like a little proud mama, but I truly am because I truly care about them too and seeing them grow and seeing them be successful. And so it's, I think that one, we all truly care about each other as a team, which is why we're a family um, and we care about our clients. So we're just, we're really passionate about what we do and about each other. And I think that that shows in, in our work. And uh, I think that was really well said because I think that, happy people, happy employees will take better care of, of the clients. Mm -hmm. If you've got somebody miserable, scared, and what have you, how much value can they really provide? All right. So now let's, let's change tracks and trajectory here. Now we're getting some deep water stuff. 
Okay, so you, you don't have to mention any names. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, but just in your years, let's talk about patterns. A pattern is when you see shit over and over and you could link it together. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So what are, from Franca's perspectives, the biggest challenges that face dealers today? I mean, if I'm thinking of patterns with our dealers and in, in what we do. And our prospects, the dealers that we do are audits firm and, and just in general. You know what I mean? Like, what do you think the biggest challenges that you 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 think that the industry has? I just think that sometimes there's just a lack of accountability or consistency in things. You know, one of the things that I always feel with our team and something that we have to overcome initially is, you know, we give them all the tools and resources, the training, but, you know, knowledge is power, but if they do nothing with it, then it's useless. So sometimes it can be frustrating. You know, you may have, um, you know, different processes or things in place, but if we're not actually using them or holding people accountable to use them, we're truly not going to see results. And so that's a pattern that I see quite often. Uh, I want to touch on that because I, I would agree. I think that it is a challenge even for us is that people pay us and we're, we're fucking expensive. You know what I mean? So they cut big checks and we cash them. And sometimes certain dealers have better results than others. And then when we look at this and we do an exit strategy and uh, exit summary, I should say, it's because somebody didn't follow the yellow big road. Whether you have dealer synergy or training company or not, I don't think that someone's job description should be optional. So this is a public service announcement mm-hmm. out there is if you've got processes and, and benchmark, if you can't go to Starbucks and 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 ask for a caramel macchiato and then they just fucking whip up some random shit. Now, now if you say, I don't want this or replace that with soy, I'm not saying that. I'm saying don't Frankenstein from the recipe do you, at, at the base start. And that's what happens, whether you have a consulting company or not, a lot of times managers don't manage and hold their people accountable for different reasons. Let's go through them, Franca. Uh, We're going to play tag. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to... So why do managers not hold people accountable? I'll go first. I think fear. I think fear is that they, they're they scared that if I hold this person accountable, something might happen. They might quit. And like, and if they quit, I know that they, they're not great, but they're better than nothing. You know what I mean? And so their fear, if they try to hold somebody accountable, they might lose that person. So your turn. Give me another reason why you think people Frankenstein the process or don't hold their people accountable. Sometimes they just, you know, we hear a lot, you know, I'm overwhelmed. I I don't have the time to, I'm short staffed, things like that. So let's talk about that right there. I think that I don't agree with this, but Mm -hmm. it's definitely a big excuse is I don't have time to. That means that you, you have difficulties with time maximization or time management. Mm -hmm. See, there's a phrase that Dr. Covey says from the seven habits of highly effective people, schedule your priorities, do not prioritize your schedule. That's not a play on words and repeat that for our audience, schedule your priorities, which means do what's freaking important. Don't turn around and do other things distracted as opportunities, but they're really, you know, uh, distractions. You see what I'm saying? So again, okay, back Mm -hmm. to me, I would say another reason is the opposite of fear because they get too friendly with people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause they're like, ah, Johnny's my friend. You know I mean, or if I was on the floor and just got promoted to management, oh, how do you go from partying and doing crazy shit on the weekends to telling somebody, you know, that, that they need to, you know, fill out their CRM the right way. So again, first one was fear. Second one is because they have a misguided sense of, of devotion or a misguided sense of, 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 of roles. See, at the end of the day, like I have four kids and I, I want to be friends with my kids. I want them to like me not just respect me and love me, but like me. And I want them to be able to come to me, but don't get it fucking twisted. I'm your dad first. You know what I'm saying? Like I, my job is to protect you and make sure that you are still able to breathe and function and you're safe. After I've, I've fulfilled that role of safety and, and security and protection and, and, and that stuff, then we could be friends. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, it's not a tie. If I have to choose as a parent to, to keep you alive and keep you safe and keep you on, on a positive trajectory versus being your best friend, I'm going to choose the responsible parent role than your best friend. And so I think that's that's a reason. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with that? That sometimes they have yeah. uh, relationships that, that mm-hmm. are inappropriate? Yeah. And sometimes there's no one over them holding them accountable. 
right? So that's a bad cycle well, too. <laughs> explain that. So if you're, so we're talking about the internet director yeah. or we're talking about the sales manager or even the GSM, why are those roles not uh, holding their people accountable? And it's because nobody's really holding other people accountable mm -hmm. and somebody yelling at you and threatening you is not mm -hmm. really holding you accountable. You know what I mean? Cause they could yell and threaten, but if they don't do shit, then, you know, you know, you could get just, just weather the storm, like Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump, Lieutenant Dan, you know what I mean? Like during a storm, like, but you know that if you just stay on the trip boat, eventually the storm's going to pass mm -hmm. and the guys or, or the girl's going to stop yelling at you and threatening you and you'll be able to go out your day. I like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Back to me. So other reasons why people don't hold people accountable is I don't think they're they're bought into the mm -hmm. system. And I just talked to a high level executive about this today. We had a mutual client and it actually was a referral of mine. So I reached out to him because he's a he's a high level uh, moderator at, at, at many 20 groups and he's a former dealer principal, et cetera. And I, I just spoke at his 20 group and we're having, you know, some some challenges with uh one of his referrals to me. And I love this guy, I respect him, and this is his 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 people. So I'm like, yeah, listen, my brother. And he's like, I know I have the same freaking challenges you do. And we're talking about it. he asked me a question. He said, Do you think the GM's bought in? And at first we're like, Yes, but then I was like, mm, I think he's 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 conceptually bought in like that, that sounds good but then if you think about it, if you say is he bought in bought in means like well, i'm ready to go i mean like I, like religious zealots i'm not trying to start a crazy conversation they're fucking committed whether they're on the wrong side of the commitment or not they're committed you know what i mean and so if you believe in a process a theory a strategy an ideology you're ready to march to the ends of the earth to you know to that so i i i said ah if you ask me honestly, no, I don't think it's about it. So that's it. That's mm -hmm. my next reason why I think that, you know, some people are not bought in because if you're bought in and they're like, well, of course I'm bought in. Mm -hmm. I, I paid for you. I paid for dealer synergy. I cut the $50,000. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I did this. I did that. I have a, a two-year contract and not all of our contracts are two years. Some of them are longer, some of them are less, but isn't that commitment enough? I was like, no, it's not. That means that you pay your bills. Okay, good. You know what I mean? Like that's a good trait to have. But just by signing up with a company, any company is not by far a show of bought in or commitment. Because if any company, my company, somebody else's company says, here is the blueprint. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Do you agree with that? Yes, I agree with it. You're going to do it. Yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Franco, you're going to do it. Yes. yes. <laughs> and then they don't do shit, right? <laughs> then they're not bought in. They're not bought in enough to do the hard work, make the hard decisions. I mean, I've got dealers that I've had in the past. I don't want to scare anybody, but I've had dealers and I've had GMs that have hired us and said, you know what? I am so committed that if these people here are not with me, then they're going to have to go. And I want to be very clear. It is absolutely not my intention or deal with some intention in any way, shape, or form to destabilize any type of HR or any type of vendors unless we've exhausted all possibilities of motivation, training, retraining, and more motivation, all right? But at, at the end of the day, you either got to shit or get off the pot. I mean, like, you, you just can't stay there. I know that it's cool to, like, look at memes for 35 minutes, you know what I mean? But if you're done, you're done. Move forward. And so, that is, I think, a challenge is that if people are partially bought in, that's worse than not being bought in at all. Because if you're not bought in, you wouldn't waste the money or the time. And, and it's not just the money, it's the time. Because if you implement a, a big process, like a new CRM, a new training company, a new department, or a new strategy, it's not just the money that you're in, investing. It's not even just the time. It is the emotional equity. Because you know what employees hate? is when, when people change processes, change vendors, change training companies, change strategies, more often than Katy Perry changes clothes. You know what I'm saying? Like, again, it just doesn't make sense. So Frank, back to you. Why else do you think dealers struggle with uh, following through with things? I just think it really has to start from the top down. So uh, a lot of our dealers that are on our program, we have weekly accountability meetings. The dealers that do best are going to be the ones where you have every single manager on that meeting on a weekly basis. They don't just have the internet manager in there and they say, you take care of it, right? And if they're all invested, they're all bought in and they're all putting in that time every single week to work together, identify what the challenges are, find solutions, 
and they're consistent with it, those are the ones we find the most success with. Um, but like you said, you can't just sign a check and say, we're, you know, you're done and pass it off to somebody else. It has to start from the top down and we all need to work together as a team. Frank, I, I would, I would concur and echo what mm-hmm. you just said. It doesn't, it's not a sign of weakness and it's not babysitting. So let's just say if you're my internet director at, at Bradley Motors, right? So if I was going to bring in like uh, the blind phone master, you know, as, as a, as a process trainer, you know, and then part of his follow-up is that we're going to do these weekly accountability meetings. I mean, as a multimillionaire, okay, the way that I need to plan my day is as an owner, which I am of multiple companies, okay, I only have so much time in a day. I need to allocate my time on things that are the most important and the most dramatic. Now, I'm not trying to overinflate my worth, but building an internet BDC is by far one of the absolute most profitable and most powerful things that any dealership can do. Let me explain. When 99% of Americans go online before they step foot into the dealership, when Google says that 90 plus percent of all transactions start in search, people find their husbands, their wives, their pets, their medication, their restaurants, their houses, and damn sure their automobiles online, then there is nothing more powerful than internet or business development operations. Internet and phone sales are the new showroom. So if I'm a dealer principal, general manager, GSM, anywhere down the food chain, if I have a company that's trying to install resurrect, recalibrate, or synergize and build, either build or problem solve a department like a BDC, for example, or a special finance department or a service BDC or acquisition department, any type of department, I, as the owner, to Frank's point, need to be in that meeting. Because even if I don't do shit there, my presence speaks volumes. The fact that I'm the owner of this organization and I see this as important enough that I'm involved, that's going to be like, oh shit, the boss is in this meeting. I better take this shit seriously. You know? And so I think that's important. Mm-hmm. And and everybody down, this is what blows me away. If you, I don't care if you're the dealer principal, the GM, the GSM, and all the sales managers, it shouldn't just be the internet director. Mm-hmm. Every one of you motherfuckers should be in that meeting. And I'm not just talking about for my clients. I'm saying out there, you know how many times the internet director and the BDC director feel like they're the bastard manager of the dealership? How is it that they are the least funded, least supported, least respected aspect of the dealership? You're like, not my store. Bullshit. Come on, man. I've been doing this for 23 years, 23 years. And still on February 2nd, 2023, the internet manager, the BDC manager is still the bastard manager of the dealership, which means they're not perceived as important or as respected as a sales manager or as a GSM. Are you kidding me? You could tell what's important. To respond to that. Shit, even Sierra don't know how to respond to that. She's like, that's <laughs> bullshit, right? Thank you. I can't even make this up. So again, you could tell what's important people while they spend their money and their time. I just talked to a dealer prospect today, not even a client. Shout out to them. They know who they are. They have 2,000 leads a month, 2,000 leads a month fresh. They have a residual flow factor of 3,000 leads. That means on February 1st, yesterday, they had over 3,000 active leads that are 90 days or less. In the shortest month of the year, this month in February, in 26 more days, they're going to get another 2,000 leads. So in the month of February, they're going to have 5,000 leads. And guess how many uh, BDC reps that they have? Eight. That's it. Eight people to handle 5,000 leads. Now, why is that absurd? Because J.D. Power says it takes on average seven to 11 attempts before the first connection happens. So if you don't have the right amount of focus and attention, it's never going to work. Give me some more, Franka. This is good stuff for people to hear. In regards to? Just like the challenge. Like, <laughs> like the, 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 let me, I know I ran. Yeah. It was, okay. You said one of the biggest challenges is accountability. Is that, you know, dealerships, dealer synergy clients or non-dealer synergy clients, they don't hold their people accountable. Beating them up, Mm -hmm. motherfucking them, threatening their jobs is not holding them accountable. Okay, holding them accountable in my definition is giving them a process training them on the process, really training, not just sticking in front of a, a training video from the freaking eighties and shit like that, or, or, or explaining it once or go shadow this person is have you trained them on this? Mm-hmm. 
No, I have my people do that. Have you inspected the training? Have you sat in the training, whether it's your sales manager's training or your training company? Have you as the owner or GM, have any of you audited the entire training to make sure that your people are getting the message that you hope and think that they're getting? Because I think most of you will be shocked, silly, like, oh my God, this is how we train our people? Mm -hmm. Holy shit. So step one is training them the right way with the right process then testing them. Mm -hmm. Don't just assume because even if the training's good, how do you know that they're listening? Do you understand there's different mind patterns? There's there's kinesthetic thinkers and learners. There's auditory thinkers and learners. There's visual thinkers and learners. And there's hybrid thinkers and learners. And there's different personality types. And that's not including all the freaking impediments and learning disabilities and all that other shit that's there. Do you think just because, poof, you said it once or you, t- you dry run this once that they're going to magically get it? Folks, real training comes from two things. Repetition, repetition, repetition. But I want to caution you, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Because if you're practicing the wrong shit, you're permanently making yourself stupid. So you have to practice the right shit for practice to make perfect. Second thing is this, experience, time. The more that they do stuff, the more experience they get, the better they're going to be. All right, so back to you, girl. Um, Well, so also, you know, sometimes we're so focused on having our team train, but we don't train ourselves as managers. So, you know, sometimes when it comes to something as simple as, you know, our phone process and they say, you know, oh, yeah, they sound good on the phone or they sound bad. Well, if you don't even know what our process is, how can you say whether or not that was good or bad? So that's a big thing. Hold on, LA, rewind that. What did you just say? I said, if you don't even know the process yourself, how can you say whether or not they sound good or bad? Exactly. Well, because I didn't make the appointment. Well, again, 100%, if you don't know what the word track is, if you don't know what the process is, first of all, how are you going to hold them accountable? How are, if you haven't taken the time to learn the shit yourself and internalize it, and here's the other thing, you've got people that like, I don't like that. I don't like this. Well, obviously the way you've been fucking doing it is not working. So if you're going to pick a system, whether you 100% love it or not, if it's something that you picked, or more importantly, your person that's your superior, the dealer principal, the GM picked. So if you're a GSM or below, not that your opinion is not important, but if somebody that's higher authority of you that's actually cutting the checks makes the decision that this is the process we're going in, who are you to undermine their authority passive aggressively? And what do you mean, Sean, passive aggressively? Well, what do you think that means? If the dealer principal GM is paying for some shit and they're saying, this is what I want to do. And you're like, it's like, like fucking passive aggressive. It's like, it's like, I don't know, like dry snitching is like, I don't really believe in it, but mm-hmm. since the owner got it, I guess we have to do it. Well, what do you think? Your people are not going to do it. You've got to adopt it. You've got to love it. And you know what? If you don't, then you should have talked about this before you implemented this process. And I'm not talking about our clients. I'm just talking about in general, anything you do from the manufacturer, from a consultant, from a 20 group, from other dealers, if you're going to have a process or procedure, everybody has got to be bought in drinking the Kool-Aid, the orange Kool-Aid. Would you agree? Absolutely. All right. So mm-hmm. what else would you like to say on this? Um, you think we beat that to death? I think we're good. No, I want more. <laughs> you need to pay attention. Hold your people accountable. Absolutely. Inspect what you expect. Mm-hmm. Inspect what you expect. Sean, what do you mean by that? If you're a dealer, GM, GSM, sit in the training, whether it's with my, like if you're a dealer, your client, sit in our, our Zoom trainings, sit in our on-site trainings. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then you're part of it. You could see what's being told. But if you're not one of our clients, just, you know, sit in whoever does train at your company, sit in there and say, hey, is this shit actually good? Is this shit actually going to help our people? Is this shit actually addressing what our challenges and problems are? And it's either yes or no. You're either pregnant or not pregnant. Either is doing what it needs to do or it's not. But I'm telling you, if you inspect it, and that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. I I know one of the reasons why, because I've surveyed this, that people don't, is their fear of finding more shit. Because we know in a dealership, it's a month, month, there's so many different things that are going on Mm -hmm. that there's always shit to fix or, or, or improve upon, always, right? So the challenge is, It's like, man, if I do that, I don't want to see what else is fucked up here. I don't want to see what other problems I have. Mm -hmm. But that's what a four-year-old says. I don't mean any disrespect. That's like a four-year-old that closes their eyes. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm invisible. No, your eyes are closed. You might not be able to see me, but I could see you. That's the same analogy is that the problem is still there, whether you see it or realize it or not. The problem is there. 
And what I love about the, the dealership world is that this isn't life or death. You know what I mean? Like there's nobody that's going to bleed out on a table like a doctor would. There's nobody that's not in combat situation in the Middle East or in Ukraine right now. Nobody's going to die from this stuff. So we have that luxury that this isn't life or death. You know what I mean? Like we have the time to fix things and recalibrate it, but it's got to start from the top of the, Mm -hmm. the food chain. Everybody from the top has got to be bought in and ready to march at the same beat of the same drum of the same song, in my opinion. I agree. Now, all right, let's go through this. So what I was saying to you, so we said accountability, mm-hmm. all right? What other challenges would you say that you uncover on a daily basis with our clients or our prospects? The lack of accountability, what else? Lack of accountability. Um, I mean, I hate to keep saying HR, but it's like each day, you know, we lose people. And so we need more people. And then, you know, for us too, we're starting at the beginning with training. So you're always kind of at the beginning. You're not really moving forward sometimes. Yeah. And this is why I like when clients utilize dealer synergy for HR. We, we, you know, we are certified through top grading and we're certified through Franklin Covey. And um, we have successfully recruited and staffed 37,000 automotive professionals. I mean, obviously heavy on salespeople, BDC reps, sales managers, GSMs, executive managers. Uh, But we do a lot of service BDC. And we just got another client today, literally uh, from down south that wants us to hire a service director, four service writers, and I think two technicians. So we recruit for everybody. And, And again, did you hire them dead or kill them after you got them? The challenge is as a training company, I'm just giving you guys free advice here. It's very hard for a good training company or great training company to go in. And if your people are miserable, the culture is cancerous, your managers are motherfucking everybody and threatening everybody. Like I'm not a magician. A trainer, you need more of a freaking marriage counselor or therapist in that scenario than you need an actual trainer. So again, what I would say, there's a chicken or the egg. Okay. Is it the recruiting staff? I think it's both is important. And so I think that dealers need to have a, a better strategy and a, a, an evergreen strategy, an omnipresent strategy, which means all the time that we're recruiting and staffing. We had a dealer, one of our clients um, from North Carolina, uh, independent store, great people, and they're struggling for HR. And then I go and their website doesn't even say anywhere you know, uh, we're hiring and there is no page to an employment page or employee value package proposition page and things like that. You know what I mean? And whose fault is that? This is an independent dealer. He's a good guy. He's, he's a hard ass like me, but I respect it because he's a no bullshit guy. He's like, look, man, I don't mind paying for shit, but I'm not psychic. I don't know what I know, need to know. That's why I'm hiring you. And so is it the web design company's responsibility? Is it the OEM? You know, he doesn't have a franchise, but like, you know, in his case, is it, you know, uh, his managers, this and that? I, I don't know. I think it's everybody has failed them at this point. And so I just want to encourage everybody out there that you should have an omnipresent, consistent strategy for recruiting and hiring. But then the question is, okay, let's say we recruited the right way and we hired the right way. Did we kill them after we got them? Which means, did we not have an onboarding strategy? Did we not have a professional development strategy, a personal development strategy, a skill training strategy, and a team building strategy? Those are multiple different things. And so that's what kills people. So HR is a problem. Mm-hmm. Okay. What else? What else do you see as a constant tra- problem in stores? You're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> I, okay. I, what about CRM? I, I feel like we're- Oh my I, gosh. Yeah. That's like the, the big elephant in the room. <laughs> so with CRM, you know, so many people, they're just not using their CRM, not using it correctly. They really don't have processes or if they do, they're really not a process. There's not much follow up there, no strategy, no plan behind it. Um, and so it's it's crazy what we find sometimes. Um, and then if they do have it, are they following it? Are they following the strategy or the processes that are in place? And when they're wondering why, you know, they're not seeing results, they're they're just not following the plan that they have. And here's the reality of this, guys. And you could just Google this. Google the following. Just go to Google and type in what is the actual hours of work for the average employee in the United States. In an eight-hour day, the average actual working is about 2.9 hours. So let's just say three hours. 
what the fuck is going on? I mean, like, and I think it's it, it, in a 12 hour day at a dealership, it's probably three to four hours. It's only one third or less is productive and effective. So when people say, I don't have enough time, that's because this is the thing that drives me crazy is if you're lazy and you don't want to do this shit, if you actually did this, it would save you time and it'd save you energy and you'd make more money. But I think by by not doing the basic shit, it makes their job more difficult. It elongates the process. It lowers the closing ratio. And there's more cancellations. There's more, you know, conversions from, you know, and, and defections from your brand to a competing brand because of lack of process continuity and process integrity. So it's very, very important, folks whether you're a deal with synergy client or not, that you set up your CRM the absolute best way with the current in 2023. I mean, Jesus Christ, think about all of the, the shit that's changed just in the last two years. What's changed? The whole fucking world has changed, okay? Right or wrong. COVID changed the way that people celebrate, the way that people communicate, the people shop, the people buy, the people refer, the people review. I mean, the whole entire aspect of human being functioning in the United States, I'm only going to speak about this country, right, has changed. So if your CRM has not changed in the last 10 years, but the entire world has changed in the last 22 months or 24 months, do you see how you're kind of upside down for, you know, uh, getting shit done the right way? I mean, you need to look at your CRM and audit Audit the processes. Most dealer principals, most general managers, most CFOs, most corporate executives for dealer groups have never actually looked at their processes. How do I know? Because on a daily basis, we're auditing CRMs. We've now, we're close to about a thousand rooftops that we've done CRM for. Can you do, can you imagine that shit? What do you mean do? Rehab, customize, or, or launch brand new CRMs. And so the workflows, the CRM processes, the action plans, they need to be methodical for every aspect, for credit applications, for trade appraisals, for um, car acquisitions, for internet purchase requests, for um, special finance purchase requests, for new car, for used car, for, um, my God, you know, let's just say for the different lead source providers, again, they all need to have their own CRM workflow, their own CRM action plan. And within a workflow and action plan is a library of phone scripts for the phone calls, a library of text message scripts for the text messages, and then a library of objections and rebuttals for the engagement and a library of email templates. So each work process for each category needs to have its own content asset library. I know that's fucking mind melting, but that's why 90 plus percent of CRMs are not set up correctly and not utilized correctly. And is that what you're finding on a daily basis? Absolutely. Um, and sometimes it's just as simple as, you know, what the team is actually saying, you know, someone may have just purchased a car. It wasn't marked correctly in the CRM and they're still trying to follow up to set appointments to bring them in. Or, you know, someone will respond back and maybe say that somebody passed away or whatever the case may be. And they're still sending messages like, hey, you coming in tomorrow? You know, so it's just they're just not even paying attention to what their team is saying or, or what they're saying to their potential customers. AutoWeb. I love AutoWeb. They're a great company. They have thousands and thousands of rooftops. I don't know if it's 8,000 or 10,000 rooftops with their OEM deals and what have you, but it's a lot. Let's just say 8,000 rooftops. That's that's fucking crazy, right? So they have 8,000 rooftops. You know what they said? 50%. That's 4,000 dealerships right now. 4,000 dealerships approximately. It takes them more than 48 hours to respond to the first internet pur mm -hmm. purchase request. Jesus Christ, guys. I've been doing internet sales for 23, almost 24 years. Since the 90s, mm -hmm. since the late 90s, I've been selling cars and selling in internet deals. You know what I'm saying? And my God, how are we in 2023 in a depressed economy, technically, in a inventory crisis, and we are not calling people back for two days? The response time shouldn't be an hour. It should be instantaneous. What does that mean? That means when you call somebody back, I want them to say, oh my God, I just pressed send. And I want to be like, sorry for the delay. I'm dead ass serious. And so I, this is what just blows my mind. How do you not call people back mm -hmm. in two days? You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that's a challenge. Or to mm -hmm. your point, you know, can you imagine if somebody comes into your dealership 
and says that, and they don't buy a car and then you don't follow up with them. Like, Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, we're going to be all professional and spend all this money, get them here. And either we're going to sell them or we're going to forget them. That makes no sense to me. Here's something else that's crazy. A couple other points. I'm going to start one and sound, mm-hmm. but I, I, I'm taking advantage of getting my girl on here because <laughs> it took me years to get her on this podcast. So now a couple other things that I see that are issues is mm-hmm. this folks before the pandemic. And if you're listening to this podcast this late, you should be rewarded because um, this is high level stuff. I don't really hear before the pandemic, the manufacturers would say the average buying cycle for a new car would be about 90 days. Specifically, 46% of people would purchase a vehicle within the first 90 days, right? I'm sorry, first 30 days, first 30 days. 46% of people would buy within the first 30 days. Then 54% of people would buy between day 32 and day 90. So again, Again, it was an average of a 90 day buying cycle and the majority of people would, would buy post 30 days. Now think about that. That was before the pandemic, before the inventory crisis, before the direct orders. And what's happening now is that process is, is upwards of five plus months. So let me be very clear in February, this month, right now, if you've got, let's just say 700 leads, if you've got 700 leads and let me do some quick math, 700 leads, I'm going to estimate fresh times 0.35 out of 700, only 245 are going to be viable for that month. Holy crap. Okay. So that basically means that 455 of those leads this month will never close this freaking month. So what do we do? When I audit CRMs, I see CRMs that are set up for a two week follow-up, 30 day follow-up if you're lucky, but man, technically you should be following up what's called the residual flow factor for up to five months, at least 90 days, at least three months. But that means that in February 1st, you should be running a report in your CRM, how many active leads that are three months or less from today active or four months from today active or five months from today active. And you need to be following up with those people like they're, they're very fresh leads you got today, plus all your fresh leads. So that's really an issue is the mm-hmm. lack of CRM respecting. But you know what I think the worst mm-hmm. is? Frankly, when we do these meetings and there's notes in the CRM that says, oh my God, Mary was so excited. She wants to buy it. And there's no other note. Like, like what, ha- what, what happened? Like, it's like you ever read something and, and, and you're excited and the page is missing. That's how I look at CRMs. Mm-hmm. I'm like, damn it. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, are you serious? Like, all right, let's go sell a car. Every day I go in, missed opportunity, missed opportunity, missed opportunity, buying signal, buying signal, buying signal. So now I got one more from you. Anything else you say that you think is a challenge that you that we see on a daily basis? I mean, if we are still kind of talking about CRM, what about all the leads that sit there that are active without any future follow-up and they're just sitting there? That's the most surprising number sometimes when we look in CRMs and we can't believe the number of leads that are just sitting yeah, there. We had a we had a, a store recently, no exaggeration. They had 900 active leads with no future follow-up. So that means that these people, they had 900 people that were 90 days or less old. So they're fresh leads. They're in the buying cycle, 900 people, and they didn't have a CRM workflow, a CRM process. So they were just in the Bermuda Triangle. So many dealerships out there have hundreds or thousands of active leads. I mean, and, and what's that? Just to put in perspective, 900 there's 90 to 110 car deals that are in there that need to be mined, right? At five G's or six G's a copy, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars a month being left on the table, millions of dollars a year in, in, in the average CRM just lingering there. So again, folks, this is why we do what we do. I love what we do. And the reason why we're so successful is you're talking to her. Mm. She's one of our most important assets. And uh, I ain't worried about you trying to steal her. She's family. She ain't going nowhere. You know what I'm saying? Again, she's been with us for a long time. And this Mm. is my sister. Literally, this is one of my best friends, my my brother Billy's wife. You know what I'm saying? So again, uh, you've had the opportunity to get to know Frank a little bit. So now, Frank, on a personal level, kind of tell people just a little bit about who you are as we start to wind down this, this interview uh, just like, what do you like to do when you're not solving all these dealership problems across the country? Things I love to do most really is I'm really big into spending time with family. So, you know, spending time with my mom, my brothers, my husband, you know, in my free time, you know, I'm spending time with them. 
I'm in the gym, you know, but it's just really just, I do everything that I do here so that I can spend time with my family and do things and have experiences with them. Um, and that's what makes all of this worth it is that I can share that with my family. All right. And so if people were impressed with you, Franca, um, you're open to answering any questions, even if you're not a dealer synergy client. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, if you just wanted to talk to another subject matter expert, a sales manager that's literally helped thousands and thousands of rooftops herself and her team, how does somebody get in touch with you? Uh, so you can reach out to me. My email is franca at dealersynergy.com. That's F-R-A-N-C-A. -A. So you can reach out to me there um, through Facebook. So what's your Facebook? It's just your, your name, Frank. Yeah. Uh, is it, would it be Frank Vidal or Frank Van Bikitis? Frank Vidal Van Bikitis. I have not officially taken my husband's last name because it's a long Greek last name, <laughs> uh, but I do have it on Facebook. So, <laughs> so, it's, so it's Frank Vidal, V-I-D-A-L. You mm -hmm. can find her. Okay. And yeah. then what about Instagram? Uh, so I think it's just Franca underscore Vidal. So mm -hmm. Franca underscore Vidal, mm -hmm. like Vidal Sassoon? Yes. Okay. There you go. Here. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I want you to leave this interview with how much the automotive industry has means to you. And, you know, in the last almost 10 years, like what does this industry mean to you? So, you know, before I started working for dealer synergy, I really had no plans in being in the automotive industry. And then I had this opportunity and I took advantage of that opportunity. Once I finally was officially a part of the company and what I saw was available to me. And, you know, Sean and Karen Bradley, L.A. Williams, they all really invested their time in me um, in helping me grow. And so it means the world to me because my life has completely changed because of dealer synergy and overall this industry. It's impacted my life so much. Um, and so in just helping me grow personally, professionally, and I, you know, I've been here for quite some time, but I truly believe that this is still just the beginning. I have such a long way to go. Um, but I, I truly love it. And I'm just thankful of all the opportunity that Sean, Karen have given me. Listen, we are, I guess, speak for my wife and our partner, LA and the entire team. Uh, you are an incredibly instrumental part of our team. And I honestly think that you need to be doing more of these things because you are one of our secret weapons. And I think that the industry needs to know you for a couple of reasons. One, first of all, um, you know, you are a female and I don't think there's enough like females for, I was gonna say strong females. There's not enough females period mm -hmm. in automotive, but the damn sure not enough strong, successful females in the automotive industry. That's the first thing. Second thing is you're also a minority like me and Karen as well. Uh, Latina, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Among other things. So <laughs> to be a female minority in a position of power and have access to thousands of these rooftops to be uh, like, I mean, you got to look at these reviews. Mm -hmm. Franca, 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 mm -hmm. Franca, Franca. You know I mean, I have people try to poach her and stuff like that. Even though we have, you know, no poaching clauses in our contracts, I can't poach your employees, you can't poach mine. They still try to, you know, get her to convert. But uh, Franca, honestly, on behalf of our entire company, thank you so much for all that you do. And guys, uh, this might sound cheesy, but we do this internally like for real. So we do, whenever we give kudos in here, we don't do golf claps, we do mm -hmm. snaps. So straight up snaps from my girl, Franca. We appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. So there you have it. The Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast. This podcast comes to you every week from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If you have a question about the show or would like the chance to become a guest, feel free to contact us directly at 856-546-2440 or email us at Millionaire Car Salesman at gmail.com. This program is a presentation of Synergy Records, produced by Tiana Mick and L.A. Williams. Production and engineering by L.A. Williams. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast is hosted every week by L.A. Williams and the Millionaire Car Salesman himself, Sean V. Bradley. The Millionaire Car Salesman podcast can be found everywhere, so please don't forget to review, subscribe to, and share the show. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire Car Salesman podcast, and remember, where I'm from, money provides options. If you enjoyed this podcast, then make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave us a review. You know, let some other folks know about it. Oh, and don't forget to join the Millionaire Car Salesman group on Facebook. We'll see you there.